So welcome back. I'm glad that you managed to wake up after spending all night working on homework one, which is due at midnight. Or maybe you'll stay up tonight and work on it instead. So, so does anybody have any questions about it uh, while we're all here? OK, good. We're all. Uh, right after class, there are office hours that I have. But if you have a detailed question about Hopper, then the, I would rather ask the GSIs if they have office hours today. Two to three. And this is a very good opportunity to ask questions because we have, after I finished the little bit of MPI that I didn't finish last time, we have two guest lecturers, David Skinner and Richard Gerber from NERSC, who are staff up there, who are going to be talking about performance and debugging tools that are available on Hopper. And so uh, this is a good time to ask detailed Hopper questions. So, but let me go on and uh, continue. I will try to finish quickly all the material in, on MPI that I didn't finish last time. And so this is about distributed memory programming. And let me now skip ahead to uh, the slide that I want to be on. and review everything I did last time in one simple slide, which says that there are only six subroutines you've got to know about to write the simplest possible MPI code. So remember the way you work it is you're writing basically sequential code, but a copy of it is going to run in every processor. And the way they're all going to know that they're all there is that the very first thing you need to do when you enter your main routine is call MPI init. When everything is done, you call MPI finalize to give up all the resources that you're done. So then, to run, how do you coordinate with all the other processors? Well, you can ask how many processors are there. That's a single subroutine call. You get the size. You can ask who am I. So you know if you're processor 1, you do you know, one subset of the data. If you're processor 2, you do another. That's MPI com rank. And the rank is your number from 0 to the number of processors minus 1. And then to communicate, finally, there are sends and receives. And uh, those were the two most basic uh, ways to go. So, so to send, you have to say with whom, you know, which communicator, you know, which subset of the processors do I want to send a message to? Uh, what is the address of the destination, processor one, two, three, or four? Uh, the data itself. And then when you receive, you say, who do I want to get the data from? It could be I'm expecting information from processor zero. Or you could say I'll take it from anybody, and you supply some space. There are many flavors of send and receive I didn't get into last time, but, but that's sort of a brief summary. So there's another way to go about it. And you may remember that when I, just before I spoke about uh, MP, MPI, I talked about tricks with trees. So many of those uh, collective communications that involve trees are all available as MPI subroutines. So now I want to go in and just describe those a little bit. I mean, we all remember broadcast and reduce and scan, so I won't need to define them for you, but I do want to just sort of explain them a little bit. So the two most basic ones are indeed broadcast and reduce. And so the way these work is that every processor in a communicator has to call broadcast. And otherwise, you're going to get a deadlock of some kind. Somebody will hang. So everybody says broadcast. And everybody has to agree on who is the root. And so everybody will say process 7 is the root. Process 7 will do the broadcast. Everybody else receives. And it all returns when finally everybody has the data. And a reduction is very similar. Everybody has to, everybody has to call reduce. Everybody has to agree on who the root is, agree on number 7. And when it all returns, number 7 will have the reduced operation. And of course, it could be a sum, a max. You have to choose that too. And so uh, in, instead of writing all your code with sends and receives, you can imagine six other subroutines. You still have to initialize. You still have to finalize. You still have to know how many processors there are, probably. And you still have to know who you are. But then you can call broadcast and reductions. And so let me just write one very simple code uh, to compute pi, which we know the answer to anyway. But let me just use broadcast and reduce to write a very simple program to compute pi by basically computing the area of a unit circle. And so what I'm going to do is just run, run a very simple integration scheme to compute the area of the first quadrant, multiply it by 4. And if I have four processors, I'm just going to divide up, you know, take a Riemann sum of this little quadrant. And if I have four processors, uh, each processor will get one-fourth every quarter of these little tall, skinny rectangles, and it will sum the area of that. And so let me just tell you how to do this. Each processor is then going to get 1 over p of the intervals. So it's going to be two, two pages of code. And so here it all is. 
So as before, you have to include some files, so the, so the routine needs to understand how to, how to call MPI. Um, and then, uh, whenever you call MPI, you have to have argc and argv as initial variables, and those tell you things like the number of processors. And so the very first, after some declarations, the very first thing I do is MPI init, and, and I pass in those two arguments, as I did before. I call MPI com size, and I say how many processors are there, because I divide up the integration over P processors. And uh, MPI com world, so I assume all the pro I'm going to use all the processors. That's the communicator. I ask, who am I? And then I have an infinite loop, and I wait until uh, I say I don't want to do it anymore. Processor 0 will uh, input the, uh, the number of rectangles in which I'm going to break up the integral, so that's n. And then processor zero broadcasts, everybody calls this line of code, processor zero broadcasts the value of n to everybody else. So, and I'm broadcasting, it's one word, it's an integer, so MPI knows how, to, what, how it fits. Zero is the root, and I'm broadcasting it to all the processors in COM world, which is the universe of processors. And then if n is zero, that's how you end the program. You say, I want to do zero rectangles, then the program breaks and stops. So that's how I get started. And then the code itself is very simple. Here is perfectly sequential code. It's just summing the areas of all those little rectangles. And it's taking steps of, of um, numprox. So it's, you know, it's jumping every num, uh, numprox oper, uh, processors. When it's finally done, it, it has its fraction of my value of pi. So that's one piece of the value. And then I do a reduction. I pass in my subset of the sum. Um, and I'm going to uh, do a reduction. It's going to be one word. It's going to be a double precision word. It's going to be an MPI sum as a reduction operation. Processor zero is going to get the value. All the processors are, are participating. And then if I am processor zero, I get the value of pi reduced from everybody. So that's the destination. And then I print it out and compare it to the true value of pi. And uh, of course, it's not going to be very accurate unless n is huge. And then it's finalized and I'm done. So that's a very, the simplest possible program you could write. So the holo world of reductions. So let me just give you a few more routines, a quick tour of all the different MPI routines. There is a barrier, but there's hardly a reason to want to use a barrier. The only reason you really need it is for timing. So you set up your program, you call barrier, and call the timer, so everybody agrees that they're starting at that point. Then you run the program, and then at the end you say barrier, and you call the timer again and subtract, and that's how you do timing, because you want to make sure everybody starts at the same time and ends at the same time. So that's basically the use for doing barriers. So there are a bunch of other collective routines. I, I talked about uh, reduction and broadcast. So let me just draw some pictures of the other ones that are available, because there are a bunch of other common pictures. So here's broadcast. So assume I have four processors. Each one has an array of four words. Broadcast, I already showed you. Processor zero broadcast, so everybody gets a copy of its value. But there's, two but there's another version of it, which is called scatter. In that case, processor zero has p, in this case, four different values. And it wants everybody to get a unique value from that array. So scatter takes this a, b, c, d from processor zero, and each processor gets one of them. And gather is just the inverse of that. It takes one value from each processor and gathers it together so processor zero has the union of all, everybody's data. So those are common enough patterns, so you can call those two. So in all these cases, let me just remind you that all the processors have to agree. They all have to say, I'm going to participate in this operation because if one processor does not call one of these collective routines, it'll hang. So that's a problem. So, uh, and when you identify the root in any of these, in any of these routines, then the root is, everybody has to agree that processor zero is going to be the one who is at the root of the tree that's participating in this. So let me just show you a few more. So there's all gather, in which case you want not just processor zero to get the word of data from everybody, you want everybody to have a copy of it. So that's a small variation, but that's available. And then there's all to all. And probably another word for this would be transpose. Because if you look at this, I'm really just taking this little 4 by 4 matrix, and I'm essentially transposing it. So everybody has one value it wants to send to another processor, and that amounts to a transpose of the data. So that is also available, is built in. Now you could build any of these. So for example, all gather could be done by a sequence of, of P broadcasts. But this is more efficient. It use, it's optimized lower down to, to overlap all the communication that would, could be done there by four consecutive broadcasts. So here's reduction, I've already showed you that one, so just to complete the pictures. And then there's the scan, where I want to compute all the prefix operations, A, A plus B, 
a plus b plus c, and so forth. Okay, so let me just put on one page here the list of all of these different routines. So there's gather, there's reduction, there's broadcast, there's reduction, scatter, and scan. Now, they come with all these different flavors, so I'm just trying to give you, you know, this sort of sense that there's this space of different operations. So sometimes it, there's just gather, but you could also have the word all in front of it. So all of these different routines come either with an all in front or not. And if there's an all, that means everybody gets a copy that I showed you the pictures of before. So there is a, uh, let me just go back. So here is a gather, processor zero gets the copy of everything. And here's all gather, and everybody gets a copy of everything. So every one of these routines has an all version and a non-all version. They also have a version where there's a V at the end or no V at the end. And if there is a V at the end, that means the amount of data on each processor can be different. So here, I had an equal amount of data on each processor, four words. That doesn't, you don't have to have four in every processor. It could be different. And in that case, the semantics are a little different, but there's a V at the end. Those are all available too. Um, and so let me just say that you can also define your own operation. You, you don't have to use the collective operations that are available. So these are all the built-in ones when you do a reduction or a scan. These all have to be associative, right? That's the only property that we require. So you can have max, min, product, sum, logical operations, binary operations. So what's the difference between logical and binary? Binary is sort of bitwise logical operations. So you take all the 64 bits in a word and you and them independently. So that's what binary is. And then you can also do find, the, find not just the maximum, but where is it in the array? Is it the third entry that's the max or the fifth or whatever? That'll come out too. And you can always build your own. Okay, so I want to make sure I don't use up too much of these guys' time. So um, are there any questions on MPI? There are many more slides in MPI. The manuals fill up hundreds of pages. But I would like to give our colleagues time to make sure they can talk about the tools. So does anybody have any questions? So I'm now going to let David speak, who's going to talk about the principles of all these different tools. Okay. Um, well, let me... So my name is David Skinner. I work up the hill at NERSC and uh, in Oakland is where actually our big computers are now. Um, I like the survey that Jim just gave over MPI because it's sort of the, the important parts, let's say. Uh, don't, don't feel obliged that you have to use all of the MPI spec in what you're doing. Um, what I'll be talking about, and I hope this can be a discussion if you have questions, raise your hands, um, is about um, where performance comes from and where it goes, uh, you know, when you're uh, bringing a, com a computer program from an idea up to running on a large computer. And uh, so Richard and I are uh, uh, worked for a long time kind of helping people make things run fast on big computers. And that's, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, basic uh, uh, sort of concept work, but also a lot of practical stuff. So I hope this is a practical and useful introduction to you. Um, this is uh, some boundary conditions sort of for how, how these uh, slides got to be here is really they're, they're meant to, to get across some principles about performance and scalability. Um, certain things aren't uh, necessarily, uh, weren't for me when I was a grad student at Cal, intuitive about why does a program run slow, why does it run fast, uh, how do I debug an error, that sort of thing. Um, so there are some, some core principles there. There's some uh, very practical things that uh, do change over time from machine to machine. The current ones at NERSC are listed here, uh, Hopper and Franklin. and um, it's always wonderful to see a, a healthy crop of students in CS267. Um, I do have my own imagination, though, about what you all are after and what you're trying to do. Um, and that's kind of stated here is that uh, I, I recall, uh, you know, talking with people who are interested in CS267 because they have a problem in economics or chemistry or physics or something that they want to learn how to do large-scale simulation, large-scale uh, parallel programming. Um, and uh, being a chemist, I, I tend to understand that, that crowd. Um, you know, I, I also recognize that there are people here probably who are interested in making the next generation of compilers and middleware and, and uh, the computer science uh, fundamentals for, for that. Um, I just ask you to, uh, I, I put your mileage may vary here because I want you to indulge my uh, sort of more applied uh, approach to, to some of this. So just a, one, one quick slide about NERSC in case you don't know. It's, it's a big shop, big computers, lots of people come there to compute. 
um, the, the types of techniques that Richard and I will talk about um, have been tailored over uh, a couple decades, I guess, really towards that large, large pool of people computing in a, in a shared space. Um, that's a, it's a different environment than working on your laptop or, or workstation because of, largely because of scaling issues. And those could be the scale of the machine, the scale of the number of other people on the machine and what they can do to impact your performance and, and uh, really comes down to uh, concurrency in a, in a wide variety of ways. Um, we're mostly uh, interested in, in real applications and making them run fast. Um, our uh, architectures are, um, let's say, uh, moderated towards uh, stability and, and production performance delivery. Um, we don't build gigantic uh, parallel computers out of uh, uh, video game components and things like that. Um, and so, you know, if, uh, if, if, you, if you are, and I can see why people might be interested in sort of the, the radical bleeding edge of computer technology, you know, um, a lot of these, uh, this sort of instruction is, is more towards the, uh, the more centrist uh, getting stuff done on a computer that's already built uh, kind of perspective. So uh, let's start off with some big picture concepts. And uh, again, I encourage you just raise your hand. We'll pass you the mic if, if you have a question or, uh, or a comment. So I hope that's readable. Um, the, uh, the highest level thing, if I had one slide to say, you know, is that <clears throat> performance is more than a single number, right? And that in uh, <clears throat> this imagined workflow for here from uh, formulating a research problem to publishing your results, there are a lot of steps along the way. And um, the, the performance of that sort of end-to-end -end process that involves uh, how much time is it going to take you to write the computer program, how much time will it take for the program to execute, how many times do you have to execute it, what sort of data is produced as an artifact, you know, all of these things are uh, performance related, right, in, in the sense that they, uh, they, can, they can demand time. Um, if you, uh, you know, a lot of programmers know the, the, uh, the uh, experience of putting a lot of time into writing a computer program to the point where you feel like you're going off a waterfall when you actually run it, and then you're wondering, well, how you know how, how is it going to run? So um, uh, there, there are a lot of steps involved, and um, you know, spending a lot of time on one aspect of performance uh, may uh, may restrict your perspective uh, about uh, what the overall uh, overall direction is. So uh, plan where to put effort. Uh, you know, optimizing one area can actually work to the detriment of others. Uh, there's a famous quote in uh, that I won't do justice to about premature optimization being the the root of various evils. Um, uh, you know, where you generate timings from are are important, and uh, sometimes a uh, a slower uh, algorithm is simpler to verify correctness. So, um, you know, speed and performance come with, with trade offs and costs. Question? Yes. Could you remind us what UQ and VV stand oh, for? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uncertainty quantification and, and uh, validation verification. Uh, let's see if I got a mouse. I do. Um, so, uh, you know, Richard and I are, are kind of, uh, you know, older, let's say, <laughs> in our approaches to these things. And, and one of the uh, uh, 20 years ago, you know, the idea that you, you go to a big parallel computer because you want to run a big simulation, right? And the, the simulation was too small to fit in a small computer, so you need a big computer to do it. Well, there are lots of reasons to use a big computer to do things. And um, so in, in here, in the, the middle, I put jobs, 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 which is that um, you may be lucky enough that you run one simulation, and then you're done. And you get it right the first time, and it runs really fast. And congratulations, you know, uh, you should uh, you know, start teaching this class. Or, or, you know. um, in, in there, you can end up with lots of different jobs because maybe you need to run uh, a thousand uh, of these simulations in order to average a result to get one number. Or maybe because if you're like me, the first 10 times you try to run it, you get the wrong answer and you have to go back and you know, debug it and, and all that kind of stuff. So uncertainty quantification and validation verification are these steps where you kind of put the pieces back together and you say, are we getting the right answer? Are we getting the right answer for the right reason? What are the different ways that we can kind of connect the dots to, to show that, that this is on the right track? So performance being more than one number, you know, we can uh, put together in a, in a more concrete way here about just looking at uh, which aspects are important to optimize. 
the fact that performance is relative to the actual code that you or other people write to the input deck and to the machine type and, and state. Um, so uh, the fact that different codes would run differently on different machines is obvious you know, in, in, in one regard. But just to, to connect back to what Jim was talking about, about MPI reduce and broadcast and these other things too, is that there are choices. Certain large-scale parallel machines have dedicated hardware networks for some of those functions, for a reduction or for other, for other types of messaging. And when you type MPI broadcast, uh, in an ideal world, all of those hardware resources would be targeted towards making that broadcast run as fast as they could. Um, in actuality, you may need to you know, reckon the, the choices that were made by the person who compiled MPI for you uh, to see whether or not they got the full kind of connection to the, to the machine and architecture there. So um, really paying attention to how the application meets the architecture is, uh, is really important. So um, we'll try to focus on specific uh, use cases and some examples here. Just recognize that um, you know, vis-a-vis uh, -vis Andal's law and other sort of ways that you could get to the same conclusion, you know, there are probably a few bottlenecks or a few performance areas within any given workflow or uh, application that merit special attention. And so the first step, just like being a detective, you know, is figuring out what are those areas where I should put my attention. So the, some of these specific areas um, you know, can be broken out into serial and parallel areas that um, getting uh, the instruction level parallelism from the processor is, is very important. You know, if, if the chip was designed to do you know, eight, eight uh, floating point operations per clock and you're getting one, then there's a certain hard limit there that you've reached in terms of what the upward potential is for performance. Um, Understanding the, the pipelines and how uh, data is moved and uh, where it's available in a fast way and where it's slow is important. Um, at, the, at the parallel level, you know, finding uh, task level concurrency, finding the right sort of domain decomposition for your problem that spreads things out <clears throat> uniformly is important. Um, staying away from lots and lots of really tiny messages uh, is a, a one, one uh, very important aspect of performance engineering. And um, you know, not spending a, a lot of time communicating, if you can avoid it in a parallel application, typically focuses the productivity and performance towards uh, uh, things that actually contribute towards your, your answer. One of the last two um, kind of overall principles is, is to think about performance hierarchically. Um, you know, uh, I think computers, the computer science folks in the room probably have this down uh, much more solidly than the the geophysicists and the chemists might, but you know that we're talking many orders of magnitude of uh, differences in performance between things like registers and uh, you know messaging off node, uh, you know that that are, are radically different. So, anytime you have such a, a large impedance mismatch between those, it, it really you need to pay attention to where in that spectrum you are because you could be you know you could have performance that's a, th a thousand or a million times different if you uh, you know kind of conflate how lines work with how messages work or, or, or these sorts of things. So I like to encourage people at Berkeley to think globally and compute locally. Um, data movement in particular is, uh, is crucially important um, on, on architectures nowadays. Uh, we can think back to architectures that had one, were capable of moving one, one word of memory for every flop that they did. And um, you know that that's uh, architectures aren't really built around that uh, design specification anymore. So you have a lot of uh, memory that's that's slower to get at, some memory that's really fast to get at, and uh, understanding how to put the right data in the right place can be really important. One very concrete example of this that uh, will help you on on uh, Hopper or, or um, uh, Edison um, are on multi-core uh, nodes. Oftentimes, uh, if you have different threads or tasks that are going to be touching memory, um, the, the physical memory can actually be you know, in a variety of different places on that socket. Um, and that, that is that it could be more tightly connected with one core or with another. And if you look up in nurse documentation, other places, first touch policy, um, which has to do with where is that memory actually get allocated and stored, on a, as they are nowadays, increasingly complicated socket that has lots of cores on it and lots of NUMA uh, type of uh, non-uniform non memory access uh, 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 behaviors, 
you know, in your program, paying attention to which thread or, or which OpenMP task you know, was the first one to actually write to a memory location uh, can peg where that data ends up being stored for the, effectively the perpetuity of the program. And so um, location is really important. So let's move on to some specifics about, um, about parallel tools. In the same way that, that performance is hierarchical, tools are hierarchical. And I think the, the best, uh, and the, here's some names of some tools and sort of the contexts in which they more tightly connect. Um, the, uh, I, I encourage people to think about performance debugging like a detective novel, uh, more so than like a, uh, a trip to the mechanic where you're going to plug in a, a computer and, and the, the problem with your code is going to pop out right away. Um, oftentimes there's a little bit more digging that's involved. And as a result, the choice of what type of tool to use to investigate performance um, largely will rest with you, as opposed to you know, having one, a one-size-fits-all tool that you just plug in and you know that the, you know, the, the, uh, the transpose is shot. We need to you know, overhaul the, the transpose. Um, so hopefully some of these are familiar to you. Uh, the performance API reads on-chip counters that get down into the things like cache misses and things like that. Uh, Valgrind is a very is a common uh, Unix uh, utility that uh, has great application in HPC for looking at uh, issues with D, basically DRAM memory uh, where uh, where you might be leaking or, or moving uh, excessive amounts of memory. The uh, PMPI is the uh, uh, profiled MPI interface. So there's another set of functions that um, that are like the ones that you just heard about from Jim. That uh, that have a, a kind of wrapper around them that allow you to uh, to measure uh, the the type of performance that goes in and out of a broadcast or a reduce or a all to all V or these sorts of things, and um, and then there are things like the uh, system accounting and reporting I think is what SAR stands for but we'll tell you about uh, uh, file I/O, and then there are higher level tools that try to uh, encapsulate these different layers and give you kind of at least a high level report about uh, all of them. So tools typically um, fall into different categories that, ba uh, that Im impact uh, how they work, where they work, and what you're required to do. Um, and so sampling is just like you'd find in taking a poll. It's uh, you know, at some random interval or some event-driven interval, um, taking a measurement and, and putting all those measurements together and using them to represent the, the larger body of what happened. Uh, tracing uh, is something that is more like uh, putting a uh, a monitor in every time an event happens. And uh, hardware event counters are special registers that exist in most hardware that allow you to, to measure floating point operations and different types of events. So the trade-off between sampling and uh, tracing is, is one, uh, one area to see where concurrency and scaling come, come about. And as I mentioned, Richard and I work a lot with people on issues of scale. That uh, the program ran, ran fine on a 16-core single node on 1,600 cores, you know, it's off the rails. And so, you know, why did that happen? Um, the choice between sampling and tracing is really important in that environment because whatever volume of kilobytes, let's say, you got out of the 16-core trace that maybe was very detailed, gave you a picture of everything that was happening, um, are you going to be able to deal with that when it's 1,600, you know, when, when, it's, when it's much, much bigger? And, um, you know, as we'll see with some of the tools, that is the primary impediment to understanding the cause of a performance uh, loss or, or even a bug. So as you move from handfuls of things to thousands of things or hundreds of thousands of things, whether they're threads or tasks or whatever, you'll find that thinking categorically about them as opposed to thinking uh, individually about them is, is a necessity because um, th trying to keep track of what you know 1,600 threads are doing all at once is uh, roughly impossible compared to uh, there's one set of threads that behave this way, there's another thread of say, threads that behave the other way, and to think about those two categories. So <clears throat> whether it's sampling or tracing or uh, profiling, uh, these are some things that if you use an HPC tool, you may be called upon to do. Um, you may have to modify, put little shims or macros in, into your code, recompile your code, uh, transform the binary, uh, which is an interesting process whereby 
you, uh, you get to compile your code just as you normally would, but then another program comes in and edits the binary to basically put in some of these tools. Um, and sometimes you have to use another tool to interpret the results of the tool that you ran with. So there, there are runtime tools and then there are kind of offline post-processing tools. And these are just some names of some tools in case you're familiar with them. Richard's going to uh, dive into the uh, more specifics of the tools. Um, there's, these are all ones that, that are, people are familiar with at NERSC and you'll find documented there. Um, there's really no one right tool. It's, you know, try to, try to find some good worked examples and uh, try to think about the, the aspect that you're trying to optimize or fix within your code and, uh, and try them. So what are some answers that you can get out? Um, you know, within the domains of what's going on on the chip, what's going on on the socket, and what's going on between the sockets. These are sort of some, some perspectives on uh, often measured, often problematic uh, types of issues. Uh, you know, I, I would say if I had to pick one of these uh, that is the uh, negatively impacting a lot of people nowadays, it's load imbalance. And, uh, so, uh, you know, the general principle here that I should have put in the principles part is that if you have a, uh, a concurrent system of any sort, computer program, computer, whatever, um, if some of the tasks uh, or some of the units of concurrency are behaving very differently than others, then you might ask whether or not there's, uh, this, is, this is itself sort of the, the basis for a performance uh, defect or, or deficit. Because if you, if you notice, the MPI calls that were just introduced before, uh, one of them is, is called barrier that is a you know, full-on nobody leaves this function call before everybody enters it sort of call. So if there are uh, tasks that are slow to reach that barrier, they're obviously going to slow e all the other tasks down because none of the other tasks can make progress until every task reaches that point. But with reduce and broadcast and a lot of the other collectives that are described there, they also have synchronizing behaviors, right? And so, um, if you want a program to behave, uh, you know, at, at high scale in a high performance way, uh, and it is and it has synchronizing constructs in it, right? Then load imbalance will will kill you, you know, almost faster than anything else. Because if you have 50,000 tasks and one of them is slow to the barrier or to the reduce or to whatever the operation is, then all the other uh, you know, 49,000 tasks will, will be idle, essentially, during that time. So that's one of the, the great performance dangers with uh, the programming paradigms that we have now that are, tend to be bulk, syn bulk synchronous messaging type of uh, paradigms. So some general advice about using the, the right tool. Um, you know, uh, picking the, the right level of tool, I think, is important. Um, and uh, I think a lot of this I've already said, so I'll kind of skip forward here. Is there a question in the back? No. Okay. So I, I had a question. Yeah. So for the homework assignment that's due today, maybe it's a little late, which mm -hmm. in the, that's optimizing matrix multiply okay. on a single processor, then presumably the tools that you'd recommend would be Pappy or... Yeah, so um, you know you could use any. You could use Pappy itself, which is actually um, Pappy is has two levels of APIs. There's a high level API, which uh, I can understand, and then there's a low level API, which I can sometimes understand if I'm you know in a real technical mode. Um, so if you're out there compiling your own code, there's nothing stopping you from using Pappy uh, on your laptop, on NERSC, you know, other places. It's a great thing to learn. There are other tools that will accomplish that for you. But if you're doing a matrix multiply on a socket, uh, on a node, uh, then more than likely MPI and MPI scalability um, is not going to be that important. So you could rule out those other things. Likewise, OpenMP um, is, is a different breed of performance profiling tool. Um, if you're not using OpenMP in, in what you're doing, then you don't need that. But uh, ultimately, uh, and you know, another thing to reinforce in terms of principle is that uh, generally speaking, wall clock time is the arbiter of uh, importance when it comes to, to performance, that you can do lots of uh, performance analyses with a node that you're running on a single socket um, just by, you know, using your, your, your wristwatch or, you know, your, your computer to time things. So um, you have a lot of flexibility there. Um, 
So the integrated performance monitoring tool is one that, uh, that I've, I've worked on for a few years and is available at NERSC. These are the sorts of things that it, it does. Um, on the craze now, you do have to relink uh, your library. We, when we started out, we tried to make it super, super easy, where you just type module load IPM, and then you'd get a performance report. Um, the craze, by default, use static uh, executables, so, uh, so you do need to relink. And that's, this is what you get from uh, IPM. So this is the, uh, the sharks and fish example from CS267 from a couple of years ago running on a uh, rather odd combination, 25 tasks on two nodes. Um, and there's other wall clock information. Uh, this code spent about 1.6% of its wall clock time communicating. So is that good or bad? Well, you know, I would say that's, that's tends toward the good side. You know, if you're spending 80% of your time communicating, that tends towards the, the bad side. Um, or, you know, the, the side where you have opportunities to make it better, let's say. Uh, there's the gigaflop size, the memory uh, that's reported here is the, what you can think of as the high water mark, and uh, a little known, often learned uh, aspect of measuring memory is that there, there's the different tools report memory usage in different ways. And um, you know, the high water mark is uh, over the lifetime of the process approximately what was the, the largest amount of memory that it, that it used. Is yeah. that uh, sum of all the memories or w one processor? That is, that is the sum, yeah. So that's the sum across tasks. And that's another important uh, thing to, to, to look at is, is um, aggregation you know, across these. So that, that actually is sort of on the next slide. But if what you're after is um, driving down the wall clock time, or I'm sorry, the communication time in, in a code, in many cases, you might just really be OK with the percent communication. And you tweak it. Did it go up or did it go down? You tweak it again, repeat. So this is uh, a, a full IPM profile. So you recognize at the top some similar numbers that are up there. Um, but then now there are, are more columns uh, and, and more detail. The square brackets are uh, aggregations across uh, all the MPI tasks. So total here is, uh, is the total aggregated across the concurrency. The uh, angle brackets are averages. Um, so that's the, uh, you know, the, the uh, per task uh, value for these different things. And there's also the minimum and maximum. So the minimum and maximum are useful because, as I mentioned before, load imbalance is such an easy thing to, to get wrong. You know, there's so many ways to take a perfectly balanceable sort of problem system code and, uh, and find load imbalance in it. Um, and I can mention some of those if people are interested, but um, that knowing the difference between the minimum and the maximum is a, a kind of uh, high, high order statistic in terms of is there a load imbalance issue overall. So these break out into different, way, different places where time was spent. That is uh, wall clock, communication, IO, other things like that. Now these, uh, uh, these PM uh, underscore are, um, uh, these are, uh, on-chip counters, so FPU0 and FPU1, this, this architecture has two floating point units. So you can see, are you using both of the floating point units? Uh, and then here are some MPI calls that you'll recognize down there. So just to kind of fill in the dots here, um, MPI send was called uh, 63,000 or uh, uh, 600,000 times, um, and uh, that constitutes 71% of all the MPI traffic and 19% of all the wall clock time is the right way to read that. Um, so, uh, you know, across the space of tools, there's a, a lot of different uh, possibilities. Sometimes you don't, uh, you'll need a level of detail which exceeds what we saw on the last slide. In many cases, you will. And Richard has some, some examples of those, both in terms of uh, debugging, uh, in terms of correct behavior versus incorrect, but also, um, understanding uh, performance gotchas. Um, and you know, people like to denigrate printf, uh, and I'm actually kind of a big fan of printf when, when it works, right? And so if you had a question between you know, putting in a couple of printfs in your code that give you wall clock times here and there um, versus you know, eschewing printf and never using it in your code, you know, I, I, I think there is a place for it. And um, one of the places is that um, do you want to use a tool every time you run your code? So 
if you're part of a science team that's running, say, a colossal amount of data analysis that's come from a satellite, you know, spending the time to actually print for every kind of unit of analysis, let's say for every five minute job that goes through the computer, you know, having one timer that's printed out and logged somewhere, then when you know, you or the other postdoc working on the project or something else changes something. The code got changed, the data got changed. Uh, real tricky one is the, uh, the batch script got changed where you're now using a different number of processes per node or something like that. Then you have a, a sort of audit, an audit log and, and performance space to go back and check it. So I, I like printf, but it's, it's one of a portfolio of tools. So I'd like to wrap up with just a couple examples here. Um, uh, that Jim, if have you treated scaling, weak scaling, and strong scaling already? Or yeah, yeah okay. So just to remind people that you know there are different when we talk about uh, you know scaling a code up, there are different approaches to that. Strong scaling is you have fixed problem size. Weak scaling is that you don't. Um, and so conducting a scaling study once you have a tool, whether it's printf or uh, Tau or IPM or whatever, uh, you know, is, is the fairly simple aspect of uh, varying the concurrency and watching how the performance changes. And, um, you know, doing this sort of analysis with more than one data point puts you on the path towards doing a, a scaling study. So I would say uh, if, you, if you have one data point, which is that I ran it at this concurrency with this problem size and I got this wall clock time out, you haven't done a scaling study. Right, you have you know just uh, sort of you're, you're you're almost there, but doing a few more points and really fleshing out what does this landscape of performance look like uh, as problem size varies is incredibly useful uh, sort of perspective to have um, because when your data changes later or the code changes later or the computer changes later, um, you'll tend to be less surprised about performance that suddenly moves one way or the other and. Oftentimes, performance moves this way and, and not, not that way. So this, this scaling study has uh, five points in it, I guess. And it's looking at how large a um, 3D FFT, complex FFT, can you do on 1024 CPUs. Um, so uh, this is an uh, example that, that I use because it's, it's a pretty extreme one in terms of uh, what, what can happen in a scaling study. So, that the data there is the same as this data here, just with more points. And this is, I said, doing one, one performance measurement is not a scaling study. This one has uh, probably a thousand different data points in it. So every point on, this, on these lines is a uh, performance measurement for doing this 3D FFT, as mentioned before. Um, the, the concurrency is given by color, that's the number of cores and the problem size is given by n. So it's an n by n by n uh, FFT. And so right around n equal 1024, uh, the performance changes dramatically. And um, so this was missed in the scaling study that I presented in the previous slide, because we just had little five little points that ran along there. Now, if you have the luxury, or it's your job, to, uh, to beat a problem to death like this, you can see that the performance landscape can be a lot more interesting and varied than you would certainly know from one point and that you probably know by five points. So this is a exceptionally uh, tricky example in the sense that the FFT, uh, the performance of an FFT and its scalability depends uh, largely on the prime number factorization of the problem size. So doing FFTs on powers of two, uh, there are different tricks than you can do when they're, uh, you know, a power of two minus one or something like that. And so the, that big jump where the problem changed by essentially one you know, one floating point uh, you know, value in each dimension and the performance tanked way, way down is as an example of the algorithm uh, having very, very different performance characteristics depending on the, the input. We will have a lecture later this semester on FFTs, but just to mention FFTW is an auto-tuner that builds, tries to optimize FFTs for each dimension. So yeah. there's a potentially different algorithm for every point that's been tuned for each dimension. Yeah. And you know, reaching for something like FFTW, well, I would call it more sort of a library than a tool. But you know, it's a pretty good tool too, in the sense that if you are, uh, for whatever reason, less interested in the prime number factorization and the the kind of under the hood nuts and bolts of how the FFT is happening, and you just kind of want the best FFT given today's situation, 
um, you know, there are libraries that will help you uh, help provide that kind of expert advice. So let me see if I can do one more example here that's a little more encouraging. Um, this is looking at a uh, number of threads in a, a different code, but it's also a scaling study. So it's runtime rather than flops here. So uh, in the FFT example, up was good, down was bad because it was floating. How many floating point operations are you doing per, per unit time? In this case, down is better because it's runtime. And you can see that, you know, here there's a, quite a generous number of points sampling this performance landscape overall. But, um, but the, the, the trends are something that you can internalize and, and, and think about uh, you know, in, a, in a fairly uh, simple modeled way. OK, well, let me uh, just end this with uh, my uh, admonition again about load imbalance. Um, this is not an unusual situation for us to see at NERSC in terms of uh, what are these 1,000 tasks doing uh, in their communication. And um, so this is 1,000 tasks on the x-axis. It's uh, time spent on the y-axis. And you can see this code spends a lot of time in uh, all to all and in all reduce. Um, but some of the tasks spend less time in all to all than others. And so uh, one way to think about this then is that this you know, small variation here has incurred a large, uh, a large amount of time spent in the transpose by the tasks that, that reach the, the, alt, the, reach the transpose uh, sooner. And uh, this is, is uh, the key aspect behind load uh, balance or imbalance. So for a cartoon of an application that goes between some sort of synchronization, doing some work, and then doing some communication, um, or, you know, uh, or I.O., um, if you can make the performance landscape flat, um, you can drive load imbalance out of, uh, out of your application. Uh, to the contrary, if you, you know, have factors either in the batch queuing system or in the problem size uh, that, that may or, you may or may not be able to choose, or how the algorithm switches, you can quite easily find a, a situation where things are not flat. And in uh, a performance landscape that has many thousands of tasks in it, having things that aren't flat is, uh, is a good way to, to lose a lot of performance. So. I think that's a, a good place to turn it over to, to looking more deeply at the tools themselves. Thanks. Any questions before we move on? And if folks have questions about the tools in practice uh, later, then yeah. maybe will Richard say how to uh, ask questions Thanks. offline? Yeah. Hi, so I'm Richard Gerber. I'm actually one of the consultants at NARSC. We do a lot of different things, but thanks, um, Jim, for that plug, because I, I didn't explicitly put it in my presentation, which I should have, is um, I think you all will be using NERSC. Is that right? right. So um, you're just like all our other NERSC users, and you have access to all our resources. And, and really, the go-to place is to send email to consult at nurse.gov. Okay. We have an online um, help interface, too, which is just at help.nurse.gov. And like I said, these are missing from my slides, but they, they should have really been in there. Okay. You can also call us on the phone, and you'll talk to one of us um, immediately. So if you call us, you're talking to um, one of us who have been doing this for many years, sometimes many decades. And so you, get, you, you cut straight to the, the person that can help you. So really feel free, and we encourage you to, to use our resources for that. Um, OK, I'm going to talk about a little bit more about tools than David did. Uh, but um, here's the outline. And I wasn't quite sure how much time I was going to end up with today. It looks like I've got plenty. But, um, so I decided to move the takeaways right up to the front. So I'm going I'm to give you that right away. Um, and then we'll, we'll go on to talking about debugging tools, um, some performance and optimization tools. And then one thing I'd like to talk about at the end is, is really what NERSC is doing with what I call automatic tools. So these um, are tools that don't let you look at, the, at the, the gory detail of every line of your code, but I think that um, are very easy to use. And in fact, they, ha they, they happen automatically that you run a code, and then you can go to our website and find out, I think, um, a lot of useful things, at least at a first cut, uh, the first cut place to look for, for problems or issues. 
So the takeaways are, yes, tools can help you find errors in your program and locate bottlenecks. But in the world of HPC computing, unfortunately, there really are not a lot of standard go-to tools. So it, a lot of people have their favorites, and a lot of people really love their certain tools. But there's not uh, kind of a, a wide agreement among everybody that this is the one or two go-to tools. The, the one exception might be in, the, in parallel debuggers. There's really two um, commercial tools called TotalView and DDT, and we have them both at NERSC. Um, I think DDT is our, our primary um, debugger, but you can use them both. Th those are pretty standard in HPCs, and those can be very useful to you. I have, have a slide about those, too. As far as performance tools go, um, David talked a lot, uh, about a lot of them. There's Pappy and Tau, and it really depends what you're looking for. And um, really, if you see the bullet far, a little bit farther down, is the, the best advice is to try them and, and use what's, um, what's good for you. We hope at the end of this, David and I have given you some ideas of uh, some common problems to look for and how the tools will work in general. Um, one thing, you know, this is a, a, a parallel programming class. And so when you're looking at parallel programs, um, once you get beyond a few tasks, um, MPI uses the word rank, we'll use the word task, it means the same thing, um, is it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to look at 10,000 tasks at one time. And so you really have to start thinking statistically or looking for things that are different among the tasks. And that's what um, I think we really want to emphasize is that that's the first place to look, is look at groups of tasks that are doing things different or individual tasks that are doing things differently. And then have some um, links to where to get more information. So we start with debugging. You know, what is a bug? A bug is when your code crashes, it hangs, it gets wrong answers, it gets different answers every time you run. Basically, any time it does something you don't want it to do, it's a bug. Um, I put in a little aside here. You're going to be using the, the, the machine named Hopper after um, Admiral Grace Hopper, who was an early pioneer in um, computer in compilers and, uh, and using computers. She actually coined the term bug. And, and it actually is a bug the, the term comes from a real bug that was, at, at least in theory, um, found in, in a computer re relay switch in 1947. So that, that's a picture of the actual bug that was removed from the switch and taped into Grace Hopper's notebook. I was, um, I was telling David just a little side of a bug is my, my wife's iPad actually has a real iPad bug. We had to, she broke the, the, the glass cover and there's kits you can buy online, and we actually, I was very proud of myself, I replaced it, but there was, I guess there was a little crack under one end, and a little bug actually crawled in between the glass. So, so now my wife has a real, an iPad with a real bug in it. So what are some common causes of bugs? So um, in, in, in serial programs, um, there are things like invalid memory references, um, Trying to uh, try declaring an array and, and trying to access things that are out of bounds, dividing by zero. There's, there's a whole host, whole host of things. In the parallel world, there are, are other things too, like um, calling a send or receive, like Jim was talking about earlier, and not matching it at the, the place that's trying to receive it, or or calling a, a receive someplace before um, somebody sends it to you. Uh, out of order collectives, so the collectives are wonderful, but you know, you get a complicated program with lots of subroutines, and next thing you know, you're calling one collective over here and a different collective over there, and they're not matching. Um, you can have race conditions where you're trying to send messages to each other and then do something with um, those values before it's actually a time for you to do that. Um, and in shared, in shared memory programming, you can it's, it's great to share memory locations and the data that's in them, but if you start modifying them when the other thread doesn't expect to, that can cause problems too. So there's a whole host of things. But um, I'm mostly concentrate on the parallel. So if you have a bug, what do you want to do? You want to find it, then you want to fix it, and then you want to check to see, or at least try to fix it, and then check to see if you've actually fixed it. So the find it, that's where the tools come in. So there are lots of tools. David talked about printf. So printf is actually very useful. As David said, the problem with printf is that it's not interactive. You, know, you have to put the printfs in, run your program, and then see what happens, and then go back and recompile, and maybe put a different printf in. And it really doesn't scale well at all. So if, you know, if you're running 100,000 tasks and you have 100,000 printfs, then you've got a whole new data problem to deal with. 
My favorite reason for not doing printf is you put it in and it changes the timing and the bug goes away. That, that's, <laughs> that's, that, that's kind of the, the um, you know, that's kind of true with, with uh, all these bugs. Is, is it, when you run a debugger, oftentimes it modifies what your code is actually doing. So it might slow down things. As Jim said, a printf makes things behave differently. It gets rid of some optimizations the compiler did, and the, the bug has gone away. So if you, sometimes if you look for a bug, you know, looking for bugs is hard. Um, and also printf is just is kind of a phishing expedition, too. One thing people, um, I think, is underappreciated is how much help a compiler or at the runtime can actually do to help you. So um, you can turn on things like runtime balance checking. So if you have an array, you can, most compilers have a, s a flag that you can put in that will, sl yes, it'll slow down your, your program quite a bit, but it will, it will put, it will check your, your array bounds and it'll detect any time that you're accessing um, elements, usually just a little bit above or a little bit below, because that's the most common thing, and it'll, it'll do what, it, you can usually configure it to do what you want, but usually it'll just crash and tell you, I crashed here because you tried to do an um, array access that was out of bounds. So take advantage of turning on all the flags you can find in a compiler, look at the man pages, that can help you do things like that. That's, that's certainly a very useful thing to try to do. And then there are debuggers that you can attach to your program while it's running and, and let you examine what's going on. So a lot of you might be familiar with GDB, which is a, a very ubiquitous serial debugger. And then there are the parallel debuggers I mentioned earlier, which are DDT and, and TotalView in particular, are, um, are nice because they, they work pretty well, but they're also across many different platforms and many different compilers. So they can be very useful. And then there are um, things called memory debuggers that allow you to, to poke into your program while it's running and see, uh, look for things that are, that are bad in memory that you're doing. And I, if I'm, is it true that DDT and TotalView scale up to large distributed memory machines, but the Intel inspector is for a single socket? I've never used the Intel inspector, and okay. that may well be the case. I, I can put it up there. It's definitely true that <coughs> DDT and TotalView are... Um, quite proud of the fact that they can enable debugging at up to hundreds of thousands of MPI tasks. Right. So here's a, a, a quick uh, um, example of a, a parallel programming bug. So I've quite artificially um, taken two tasks, the first one and the last one, and in both cases put, um, called MPI receive, which is actually a blocking a call. So it will wait until it gets its send to continue. So in this case, I've called receive on both ends before I've sent on both ends. So um, it's just going to sit there forever. The idea here is to see if we can use DDT or um, to try to figure it, to try to, to find that bug. So I'm going to give a quick example of DDT, but this is kind of a generic way all these debuggers work, TotalView in particular. So you first compile for debugging with the G flag. Then on, this is, this is specific to um, Hopper or to the craze in general, but you start what we call an interactive parallel job. So this is just the syntax. You'd use uh, something called QSub. You, you go to the, the, as you start using Hopper, you'll become familiar with that. The important thing um, with QSub is to add this capital V option. This V option imports your environment variables from your local environment, and you need that to use um, DDT in an X environment. So it forwards your X display variable. And then you start the DDT debugger. Um, at NERSC, software is controlled by this thing called modules, which you can read about on our website. Um, you load the DDT module, and then you type DDT, and then the name of your executable. So that will start up um, an X Windows application called DDT, and it looks like this. And the, all the debuggers look similar in some way. They start up a window that if you compile with the G option, it shows you your source code and DDT will, will launch your parallel job and it'll start, I think it, I think it stops at MPI init by default. Okay. So it gets to that point and then there's little buttons up at the top that you can press go and play and, and it, it's really nice. So you, you hit go in this case. You can set breakpoints. You can, you can specify places in the code that you want it to run to and stop. You can do all that kind of thing. Or in this case, I think we just let it 
just hit play, we knew it hang, and just let it go until we could tell it was hanging. And then when we got to that point, by looking at our standard output or however, whatever, we, we, uh, however we determined that, we can hit pause. And wherever the code is then, on every task, it'll stop. Okay. And, it, and DDT will actually highlight it. So the, the useful thing, useful way to find your bug, if you look down at the bottom here, I've circled there are a, um, a bunch of little frames, little window frames, and one of them is called the <coughs> parallel stack view. So if you click on the parallel stack view tab and look at, at uh, let's see, where is my pointer? Oh, my mouse is my pointer. Um, okay, look down here um, at this circle. It's hard to see in this slide, but uh, if you're, when you're working at your computer, it's a little bit easier. As you can see that um, at the time it's hanging, the tasks are in three different places. And if you, you can't see it on the slide, but if you hover your mouse over it, it'll tell you what task is at what line of the code. And, and so it, that gives you a place to look. Again, see what's doing something different. See what tasks are doing something different. And then you can click on the task, actually up there at the top. This is only four tasks, so it, it, it's, it's easy. If you click on one of those boxes up at the top, it'll take you to the view for that task. And it'll show you what line that task is on. And if you do that, you will be able to see that exactly where they're hung, right? So, so it's, it's um, these debuggers are nice and can be really helpful. But what about the massive parallelism? What if you're running 100,000 tasks? Well, if you go back to this slide, you can't really put 100,000 boxes up there, right? Um, although it would be nice. So the debuggers, you know, we've, we've actually, one nice thing about there being two debugger companies is we can actually talk to them and try to influence um, the way they work. And I think we've had some, we've had some effect with them and um, influence with them, and I'll talk about that in just a second. But um, what you really need to start thinking about is what I mentioned before about statistics and summaries. And look for tasks that are doing things different from all the other tasks. Like, it might be that some tasks, if, you, if you're able to look, you can see that some tasks are using more memory than other tasks. Well, you wrote the program, does that make sense? If it doesn't make sense, you probably have a problem there. Same thing with the number of calculations performed with each task. Um, maybe just something as simple as the number of N MPI calls. This is something we'll see is, if you think every task is doing exactly the same thing, and you can look at, at some statistics that tell you that every task was not doing the same thing, that there was some variation in the number of, of MPI sends, then you know something's wrong. You can also look at the wall clock time used. This is the, the load imbalance. Maybe that's a problem. One thing that people are now, hadn't thought about a lot in the past, but now is really becoming important, is how much time you're spent doing I.O. So how much time are you spent writing to files and reading from files, and are you doing that efficiently? And, okay, so we've been advocating this for some time, and, and in DDT itself, I, they're starting to, to enable this. So one thing I just found out about that I thought was really cool is over here, um, you, can ha you can look at all the local variables on, on your task. So you can bring up a window, and if you do that, you, it lists all the local variables going down here, but what it does over here, which I think is really cool, is um, who knows what a spark line is? Has anybody heard of that before, other than David? So a spark line is, is like a mini, a tiny condensed graph. It's kind of it's advocated, I don't know, invented by, um, what's his first name, Tuck Tepke. Um, and it gives you a quick way to look at a lot of data. So these spark lines, if you look at, um, for instance, this one up at the top, so this is like a, a a program that just flips randomly a number of, of coins, you can see that the number of heads on each task is, is kind of all over the place. It's kind of random, as you would expect. But if you look down here at this thing called um, MyPE, that's the variable that, I, oops, wrong one. In MyPE, that's the variable I defined to, as, uh, to tell me what um, MPI rank I am. So you can see that spark line just starts at zero and goes up to the maximum number. It's just a straight line. So there's information encoded in each one of those little spark lines about what these variables are doing. And if you see a variable that you think should be, say, constant across all, these, all the tasks and it's got a thing going up like this, you know something's wrong. So I thought that was um, a kind of cool thing to do. 
And then another thing you can do is when you're looking at your source code, you can right click on, say, a variable and bring up this window that tells you, that will show you the, the value of that variable across all the tasks, but then it also gives you a lot of statistics about the task, about the variable, like the average, the standard deviation, the minimum, the maximum, things like that. So I think this will be very useful, and, and uh, especially when you're debugging at very large concurrency. And am I correct? It also tells you how many NANDs and infinities there were? So right. So you can tells do you, floating tells, point debugging? Right. Exactly. It tells you which one, what, which task might have had a not a number, which tells you that there's something wrong there, um, how many or infinity, exactly that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, try this out. I think it's cool. I think this will be help, very helpful. On our website, uh, well, linked to, uh, to the Vimeo website, actually, is a video that tells you how to start up um, DDT and how to use it effectively with X Windows and has a little simple example program there. I think take a look at that if you can. And all these things are actually this is one place to get information. So we have a web page on our, our website that has a few more videos about debugging and optimization tools and some strategies and links to um, these. These talks will be there as well as some links to, to more information. So going into performance and optimization. Performance, the question is, how can you tell if your, if your program is um, performing well? And, and kind of an auxiliary question is, what is good? Yeah. So just before you wrap up the explanation of the different debugging tools, uh -huh. I wanted to ask sort of, uh, what's the frontier or sort of open research questions in the debugging tools, or what's sort of missing from that space? That's a, that's a good question. I mean, what's, what's going to be challenging <laughs> to these debugging tools, and I, I don't have much experience with it yet, is you know, going into this many core world. Um, now you have what, what's traditionally called serial debugging, and then you have parallel debugging, which has you know, traditionally been MPI, and then you have threaded debugging, which P threads and OpenMP, and now you, you've going, we're going to this world where you have many core coprocessors or like the, the MIC, or I guess they call it the FI, the, the, the um, Intel FI, where you have GPU debugging, and you have to look at what's going on in the GPU, and you have to worry about data flow amongst all these different hierarchies of, um, of memory, as, as well as going out to um, disk, which really is, is something people are looking at a lot. So I, th I think that is really the challenge for these tool makers, is to somehow encapsulate all that in, at one time. So, so just to emphasize, I agree, heterogeneity is important, and also energy debugging. That's going to be, you know, a frontier, and how do you actually measure the energy in the hardware and give feedback to the user in a way that you can debug, uh, in, uh, lessen the amount of energy used? Cool. So, if performance is not good in some, some sense, can, can we identify the causes, and then what can we do about it? So is your code performing well? Well, this is what tools are for. Um, well, I guess I got ahead of myself there. There's not really a great single answer for that. Um, one thing you can ask yourself is, does it scale well, which you know, David was talking about? And then these numbers are just um, not totally arbitrary, but um, somewhat arbitrary. But you can ask yourself things like, is my MPI time less than 20% of my total runtime? I mean, is that good or is that bad? Or, um, I don't know, but certainly 80% would be bad, right? 50% would probably be bad. You want to spend as much time doing calculations as opposed to just moving data around as you can. And what about I.O.? Is that spending, am I spending 10% of my time doing I.O.? Um, is that good or is that bad? Again, that's a, a matter of, of personal, um, not so much taste, but what what you actually need to do. In some cases, you can't avoid spend shipping around data around, or you can't avoid doing a lot of I.O. These are numbers that are kind of I've heard, we've heard from lots of different sci application scientists running their codes as kind of reasonable things. Start to get worried if it's more than that. Did you have some, a comment? Looking ahead to minimizing energy, those thresholds may drop because mm -hmm. those operations use a lot more energy. Mm -hmm. cool. Is it load balance? David talked about load balancing. And um, you know, GPU coprocessors are, are really big right now. So, and you hear about these people claiming these fantastic speed ups or these fantastic performance, and, and it's all over the map. But um, the question I would ask is, 
if I have a GPU code, and so um, GPUs don't run codes by themselves, at least today, they're always attached to a processor. So I think about if I had two sockets, one had um, a processor, which I have to have, to drive the GPU, then is my performance in that case significantly better than if I took out the GPU, replaced it with another socket, right? So that's, that's the way I think about GPU performance. So if it's not, then it's not really, you're not doing well. So the next lecture will be on GPUs. Okay, okay, so great. On Thursday. And then theoretical, you, you also hear theoretical performance on chips and GPUs and, you know, what's good. So um, our experience says that 10% is pretty good for traditional processors, but if you're doing a matrix multiply, which after all these chips were built to do matrix multiplies, 10% is probably bad. So for your homework assignment, my guess is that 10% would not be great. Is that right, Jim? There you go. But real programs don't just do matrix multiplies. They have all these other things that they're doing too. Um, so 10% is okay, and GPUs, at least today, with the way people are coding GPUs and using them in, in massively parallel programs that also have lots of things to do, um, we're seeing like 1% is not, not so bad. Hopefully that'll get better. So what can we do about it? Um, in parallel programs, you know, minimize the latency, aggregate messages. Um, David talked about maximizing work versus communication. Um, one thing you really have to think about now is, is trying not to move lots of data around through the different hierarchies. And um, another is to use the most local memory. The, these uh, machines are having more and more levels of, uh, of memory, and using the most, most local memory is, is definitely a win. Using large block I.O. for um, doing your I.O., write out messages that are, don't write out messages that are 10 bytes, write out messages that are megabyte, uh, blocks that are megabyte. And um, use a balanced strategy for I.O. So if you're doing lots of I.O., which probably aren't in this class yet, but Writing too many tasks to a single file is, does not, usually not perform well, but at the same time, um, using too many files stresses the file systems too. So there's a balance there you have to play off. Um, and in addition, you want to use enough, enough tasks to do the writing to get to maximize the bandwidth, because typically you can't, well, typically you can never get the maximum bandwidth from I/O bandwidth from a single task. You have to use lots of tasks to, to do that. Um, but on the other hand, if, all your, if, if you're flooding the communication systems from 100,000 tasks with all these I.O. requests at one time, you're going to cause contention. Quickly, some of the tools. There's vendor tools. Which I'm going to talk a little bit about Craypat that's on the Cray's. Um, again, I hadn't really used VTune before, so maybe it is just serial. Community tools like Tau and Pappy. David talked about two. And um, then... I, Hopefully I'll be able to have time to talk about our NERSC automatic tools. So David talked about IPM. David is really the, the author of IPM. And I really urge you to go and look up on our website information about IPM because I, I strongly suggest everybody make at least one run with IPM enabled because for reasons that I'll show you in just a second. So CrayPat is a Cray performance tool. I think I'll jump ahead to the example. This is typically how the these performance tools work is you get access to the, the software, you build your application, and then you run something that instruments your application and produces output file, and then, um, or produces a, an instrumented binary, and then you run that instrumented binary, it produces some output files, and then you take another tool and use it to examine the output files. And you can find out about this on our website. So I wanted to spend the last five minutes or so talking about what I call tools for the masses. So this is something we do at NERSC. Um, you notice that even the, the best tools can be somewhat tedious to work. I, I looked up uh, one uh, unnamed supercomputer center for an unnamed well-known tool. And you go to the web page how to use it. And it says, follow these 10 steps to perform the basic analysis of your program. All right. Already, I think you've lost a lot of people right there, but even then, you can see it's not necessarily an easy task to go through. So what we want to do is enable easy access to information that can help you improve your code. So what this means is automatic data collection and then expose that data to you through the web, easy. So some of the efforts we're doing um, are IPM. So IPM is not quite automatic because it's not on by default, but if you 
you can talk to me, you can talk to David more about it, it's really easy. On some systems that, have, that support dynamic shared libraries better than the craze do, it's, it's trivial. On the craze, you just have to link against a different library and then run your code. But it's very low overhead, and if you do that, your, that data is automatically collected by us and then exposed to you through a web interface. You don't have to do anything else. We also are collecting accounting and Unix resource um, data, doing the same thing. We're doing system level I.O. monitoring and um, doing the same thing with that too, and, and user level I.O. profiling, and we've, we've started to do that too. So I'm going to show exa some examples of how that works. So David showed you this IPM graph. It has the, some statistics that we talked about before, minimum, maximum, and whatnot. If you run IPM, then it gets automatically ingested into the NERSC website, into a database, and after your job is finished, you can go to our website, find it, click on it, and you can bring up a display that looks like this. So each of these little boxes in this table are meant to represent a different MPI task. So this gives you a way to quickly look at this and see by the color coding tasks that might be doing something different. So this particular one, I'm not sure you can read it, I'm not even sure I can read it. This metric is, um, this is the aggregate floating point, this is how many floating point operations each MPI task did. So um, is this what your program is supposed to be doing? Maybe, there's some um, blue ones there that that's 100%, but then there's some that are doing like half as many floating point operations. So did you intend that? I don't know. It's your code. But if you didn't, then maybe half of those are sitting around waiting for the other ones to do all their calculations and doing nothing. So there are 2,000 tasks and each little box is a, is a task? So this, yeah, there's 2,000 tasks. And this is really kind of the limit of our scalability on this kind of display, right? Um, but yes, and you could click on different metrics there like gigaflops per second and other things. But if, if you look a little closer up at what, we're look, what we've shown here for each of these, you see that we're, the statistics we're talking about. So we're, we have the mean and the standard deviation. And this thing, CV, is the coefficient of variation, which is the standard deviation over the mean times 100. So if that number is large, and by large, usually um, one or greater even, that's something you might look at to see why it's varying like that and if it should be varying like that. If, it, if there was no variation, if everything was exactly the same, then it would be zero. So here's just another quick example of something. That I think this is, the, um, this is an MPI receive, the time spent in MPI receive a, across all the tasks. And so you can see some definite patterns there. And you can see that, um, again, some of them are spending half as much time in MPI receive as others. And is this what your code should be doing? Is this what you think your code should be doing? If not, it gives you some ideas of places you can go look. But the, the thing is that you didn't have to do anything other than run your program and you get this. No 10 steps. One, th other th one thing we just started doing, and we need some better statistics, so the statistics at the top right now are not that useful, but um, they will be. In particular, this is the I.O. Um, from your job, and some, one of the statistics we need is what percentage of the total runtime is this. But that's coming. But it gives you, th gives you things like, um, the number of writes you did of a certain size. So in this case, this code was doing 91% of its writes using a buffer that was less than 100 bytes. So you may not know it, but I can tell you right now that this is not performing. This code is not performing well. So then the question is, is you know, was the I.O. a large percentage of the total runtime? If it, if it wasn't, then who cares? But if it was, then writing larger chunks of data to disk is going to improve your I.O. time, definitely. Another thing we're doing is system level monitoring of I.O. And so um, one of these is the, the I.O., the, the aggregate bandwidth through the system, and the other is um, the metadata requests that go through the system. And so where this might be useful is if you notice your code is running um, different amounts of time each time you run it you can go click on a link that's right next to your code and it'll show you what the system was doing at the time. So with I.O., there's lots of contention on the system. If somebody else is running a program that's not even yours and it's using disk resources heavily, it's going to affect, it's going to slow you down. And so if, this, if you suspect something like that might be going on, you can click on the job and you can see, oh, I was doing fine and then somebody, those red guys, started using the I.O. system like crazy and did that slow down my code? Or maybe it slowed down my code. But again, this automatically gets on the website. You don't have to do anything. It's there. 
And then lastly, one of the things we have right now is some people care about topology on their parallel codes. So these big systems have different communication hardware and different schemes for routing messages from one to the other. And sometimes, close, sometimes being closer is better. You might have lower latency, higher bandwidth. If you have to go all the way across the machine to send a message, it might take longer. Um, some codes are sensitive to that. Some, some architectures are sensitive to that. Some people really care about that. Um, you can go on our website and click on, a, click on a little link next to your code, and it'll bring up this 3D display that you can rotate around and see where, for that run, your MPI tasks were mapped around, in this case, a, a 3D torus on Hopper. Right? So that's the kind of thing we're trying to bring, and I, I think I'm going to end with that. Yeah. So, so maybe I'll ask the last question. <laughs> Uh, so how much will the performance depend on the topology if you run it again and you get a different subset? Um, how much variation should you expect? You, ideally, you should expect no variation, right? <laughs> it's a flat world. Um, it depends. It depends a lot on your code. If your code, the, the, thing, that, the thing that varies the most typically um, will be the latency between, between tasks. If your code is, is really dependent on that latency, if it's sending lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of typically small messages, then it really, it will depend where you end up on that torus. Any more questions? So, so all of these slides will get posted on the website. Uh, didn't have time before lecture today, as well as pointers to the follow-up place for questions. Okay, well, let, let's thank our guests. Thanks.